Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our latest farm equipment webinar in conjunction with TractorZoom. I am Ben Thorpe, Associate Editor, joined today with our three presenters. We have Kevin Vandervoort, the Used Equipment Manager at Hoover Inc., which is a 12-store Case IH, Kubota, and JCD dealer in Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. He is a loyal Penn State alum, and Vandervoort has 17 years of experience in the farm equipment industry. Uh, our next presenter is Austin Boyd, who is dealer principal at Bobcat of Davies County in, in, in Indiana. Uh, Bobcat of Davies County supplies new and pre-owned inventory and provides parts service rentals and financing to customers. He's a proud graduate of Purdue University and his family's business of Boyd and Sons includes equipment, trucking and farming services. And now a familiar face for our Tractor Zoom webinars, we have Andy Campbell, market analyst. He is responsible for industry analysis at Tractor Zoom. He's experienced helping over a dozen organizations in multiple industries, has helped turn data into profitable decisions. Growing up and continuing to help run his family farm in Northern Iowa, Andy combines the agricultural understanding with his work experiences to mold Tractor Zoom data into actionable insights for IronComp's clients. He is a graduate of University of Iowa, and he's looking forward to this Big Ten showdown. So those are our presenters. Thank you again for joining us. And before we jump in, I just want to say, uh, if everybody looks to the bottom of their screen, there is a little Q&A icon. And if at any point during the presentation you have a question, you can submit it there, and we'll batch them all together. And at the end, we will answer uh, as many as we can, time allowing. So with that, I will uh, first turn it over to Andy. Andy, for anybody who doesn't know, can you quickly explain what TractorZoom does and what it does for dealers? Sure. Yeah, the, uh, at the very core of it, uh, TractorZoom works to connect buyers with uh, the equipment they need, uh, whether that's supplied by a dealer or an auctioneer. Uh, and so really, we're a data company at heart. And then being a data company, you know, one of our areas of expertise is SEO and, you know, getting uh, people through the website and uh, optimizing that search. So we've been able to drive more leads to auctioneers and dealers. I think we're sitting at about a 200% uh, increase year over year on the amount of leads that we're sending to dealers. Uh, and so, you know, we can do this uh, listing for dealerships, for auctioneers, and we can do it for free just because we are a data company. And that's really what we're focused on. And that's really what I'm going to share with you today before we get into the dealer panel is all this data, all this data uh, that we're aggregating, whether it's from auctions or dealers, uh, I can turn that around and create stories. Uh, and so with the data that flows in, that's our Iron Comps model. And it's just essentially a real-time valuation model that helps people find comps, uh, understand supply in the market. And then it's just a good source of data for people to make better, faster, uh, more reliable decisions. So in a nutshell, that's kind of TractorZoom's business model and how we're helping from the listing side all the way to the valuation and supply side. Uh, and I will say just if anybody's on the webinar and uh, they're not currently listing with TractorZoom and they want to, like I said, it's free, it takes just minutes to sign up. Uh, they can just shoot me an email down at the bottom of the screen and I'll take care of all of that for you. So uh, if anybody's not doing it already, um, just hit me up. And I'll help them out. Right. Now, before we move into our Q and A portion, Andy, um, TractorZoom is of course a great source of market data, and I understand that you've prepared some information on what you're seeing regarding the uh, current direction of equipment values and supplies. Can you uh, walk us through some of that? Sure. Yeah. And uh, you know, I don't want to take up too much of the time. We've done uh, market trends webinars before, and we will uh, in the future again. But I do think it kind of helps set the stage for what we're going to talk about. And uh, it was one of the reasons why we first decided to have this webinar is because it was about six months ago. Uh, we were talking with a lot of dealers about compact tractors. And I know I've talked to Kevin about them. I've talked to Austin about them. Uh, supply really mounted last year. And so that was really the impetus for this webinar. And then uh, after talking with Austin and Kevin, I really wanted to pull their expertise and, and have them on here as well. Um, but anyways, yeah, so we're just gonna cover compacts in a little bit more detail and then really high level uh, row crop and combine before we get into the discussion around data. Uh, so anyways, starting with compacts right now, uh, I'm gonna show you a little bit about where the data comes from and then what I'm actually seeing with the data. So really quickly within Iron Comps, which is our product within TractorZoom, 
we can go into market trends, you know, look at any category, whether it's combines or tractors. Here, I'll just look at tractors and, and kind of look at our larger 300 plus horsepower tractors and can even narrow it down. But it allows us to look at popular models, uh, price changes, and I can, you know, look at any kind of ties in. And then if I'm just interested in these row crop tractors, um, I can filter down to that. But anyways, it allows you to see in that subset, you know, the supply that we're pulling out or what was actually sold. And I use these two points of data to figure out our months of supply. And another thing I like to do is try to kind of understand the washout curve a little bit. So I'll look to see in these tractors, you know, what's the supply currently sitting in this market and how was it compared to a year ago? And then I can even look at the price, you know, now versus a year or even a few months ago. And so I can look at price changes that way. So anyways, I just want to say that's where the, the data is coming from. And then I've taken that and I've just aggregated it really simply uh, so I can get across the main points. And like I mentioned a little bit ago, the reason why we initially wanted the webinar was, hey, we're seeing these compacts and uh, subcompacts just take off in terms of the age uh, that they're sitting around. Everybody knows the story of what happened during the um, COVID years and uh, the purchase of them, the production of them. And then since the demand is little, uh, has dried up. Now, I think this is changing a little bit now. I'd like to, you know, maybe even later get uh, Austin and Kevin's take on this. But up until April, we were seeing this rise. Now we're seeing it top a little bit. And, uh, and here in aggregate from that iron comps data is what I'm seeing in compact tractors only. Uh, about a 37% year over year increase in the amount of supply that we're seeing. Now, it doesn't sound that drastic, but keep in mind that a lot of that supply was actually built up in 22, 21 into 22. And so year over year, you know, it still continues to grow. But really, if you look at this graph, you know, we're seeing that top off a little bit in uh, December, starting in December. And, you know, with that supply growing, we're not seeing sales uh, match it. Uh, we are seeing sales grow up a little bit, but I'm really seeing a little bit more in the, the growth of sales happening here in 23. Uh, and I don't know if that's from creative financing. I've talked with a lot of dealers that say they're they're being more creative in their financing or they're actually now dropping down that, that price, which they're hesitant to do. Um, but that might be moving tractors as well. Um, but anyways, that's increasing sales. Take your overall supply divided by the monthly sales and you get your months of supply metric. Uh, it's just one of the things that we track here at TractorZoom. And it grew a lot in 22. It continued to grow until December. And it's, you know, erratically, but erratically coming down a little bit here in 23. Um, so anyways, compact tractors, months of supply, doesn't look too bad year over year, but it is still pretty elevated. Um, and again, I know this is really dependent on the dealerships if you're a dealer heavy in compacts and sitting on a lot. And there's other dealerships that aren't dealing with many of them at all, uh, or it's not a big part of the portfolio. So I know what a lot of it depends on the dealership uh, style that you're in. But that's what we're seeing with months of supply on compacts. Now, I'm just going to show a little bit on row crops and combines before we get into the good uh, meat of the discussion here. But combines, uh, a whole different uh, ball of wax. So combines started to see in August that the supply was eventually returning, and it, it did uh, due to a lot of late deliveries that we we're seeing kind of post harvest for some created a, a bunch of issues, especially with those class A combines. And um, yeah, and so the combines have been a uh, hot topic for a while. They're seasonal, so you will see this month's the supply seasonally dip, uh, especially into August, that great selling month in December and then rise back up. So I would really try to look at this year over year. It only shows a 7% increase in the months of supply year over year, but you can see in this graph here, what a drastic drop off May to June was. And uh, my best take on this is there was a lot of dealer auctions, some liquidations, uh, people really trying to move some class eights off a lot. Now, again, this is all combines. If I look at this just with class eights, the the year over year number is drastically higher. Uh, there's still an issue, even though there was a lot of auctions that happened just this past uh, month. But, um, but yeah, the combine market, if you want some good news out of it, last May to July, the months of supply metric dropped 38%. This year, May to June, it's already dropped 30%. So the percent that's getting unloaded on the market is almost matching. Well, it probably will match last year, probably exceed last year. On the percent decrease. Uh, problem is that you know those a lot of class eights are still going out in the market, and so they're 
but finding homes on farmers' fields and, uh, and that need might be saturated here um, in the next year. Okay, real quick, uh, wrapping up with row crop tractors, just looking at 300 plus horsepower here. And I will mention, since we're kind of keeping the focus on the data piece and not the market trends, if I'm not covering a, uh, a topic, a category that someone's interested in, shoot me an email and uh, we can jam on it some other time. I can dice up the data any way you see fit and, and answer questions that way. But looking at the months of supply, again, the combination of overall supply in the market divided by the monthly sales, uh, it was steady eddy all last year. And I was really thinking that this was a very just kind of a robust category. Uh, obviously, tractors, multi-use um, and valued in the market. Good farm profitability last year kept the demand high. And we even saw, if I was going to break this down into supply uh, coming into the market, we saw supply returning about halfway through last year but it was easily met by the demand. Uh, and so whatever was returning was being sold, prices kept on increasing. Now I'm really interested to see here in 23, what's gonna happen to the rest of the month because this increase that we've seen March till now is drastic. Uh, I don't know if it's a cause for alarm, I, I wouldn't necessarily say so, but there's a lot of headwinds that are going on against a large row crop tractor market. So you not only got, um, you know, let's call it uncertain farm profitability, regardless of what the markets did today. Uh, it's unknown what the, the farm profitability is going to be. The weather patterns are really tough, especially with the heat wave coming. Um, we've got higher interest rates, much higher prices. And then, um, you know, even have the 179 deduction uh, question mark this year that, you know, it's 80% versus 100% last year. And so a lot of question marks when you talk about this category here. And so it's at least an area that needs to be paid attention to uh, very frequently. So anyways, in a nutshell, uh, that's kind of where these three categories are. Like I said, if any other questions about a category I didn't cover, just shoot me an email and, uh, and we can chat about it. On what I do. Appreciate uh, it. Now, beyond that, Andy, um, you obviously work with a lot of dealers and a lot of agricultural adjacent companies around the, uh, the country. What are some of the patterns that you're seeing help these organizations kind of master their data game? Yeah, uh, good question. The, uh, you know, I've had the chance to work with a lot of good dealers, um, you know, Boyd and Sons and Hoover uh, with Austin and Kevin and uh, a number of other ones. And so, you know, watching what they do and then also just paying attention to a few other industries uh, and seeing what they do for adoption of technology. Uh, there are th probably three big trends that I notice or three big aspects. Uh, one is definitely on the, the people side. So whether it's managerial or building up culture, uh, it makes a big difference. And, you know, you can have the best tech, but if the people don't use it, it's not really worth much. So I'd say on the, the people side, it's making sure that your data strategy aligns with your business strategy. So it just makes sense. Uh, so understand what your business strategy is and then making sure that uh, you're using data uh, or whatever you're after with data aligns with that. That's probably the number one thing uh, that I see that makes, you know, makes these businesses tick. Uh, and then also just mapping out where you're at and what you need. And it could simply be going around and surveying your managers, your leaders, and uh, just asking them, you know, what decisions are you making? What decisions uh, what data do you need to make those decisions? That helps. And so that would say that would help with the people piece. The second one is obviously technology. Uh, you do need to invest in the tech, whether it's your money, your resources, or your time. Uh, Cloud-based solutions definitely help with that in terms of scaling. Not everybody can invest in a massive IT department, but if you can do like a SaaS product or cloud-based solution that can grow with you, that obviously makes scalability help. Um, quality always matters. I was just talking with our data scientist recently, and he's got a bad or he's got a, a great um, no, saying on bad data. He's like, it costs you one dollar to clean your data before it enters your system. It costs you ten dollars to clean your data after it's already in the system, but it'll cost you a hundred dollars to um, deal with the implications of bad data in your system. So it's just one quick thing that he said to me one time that stuck. Uh, and we've seen it play out. So clean data, and then just make sure your analytics are easy to use. And it's all about actually getting to use, which is the third piece after people, after tech, then it just gets down to action. So, you know, 
how do you actually make a decision and how does it actually work uh, for your people? So getting to from insights to action is kind of the name of the game. And then continuously learn and improving. I say those three things are, uh, are, are what I've seen in the industry. So, so anyways, yeah, those are the three things. Um, and I've kind of mentioned this a little bit before, but before I turn it back over to Austin and, and Kevin, I do want to mention, you know, knowing those three things and, and designing this, um, this webinar, that's why I asked Austin and Kevin on here. Uh, you know, Kevin, I've known for quite a while. Uh, as Hoover's been a partner with TractorZoom. I've had a lot of chances to talk with him and meet him. Um, but I've always just been impressed with his very humble curiosity on his approach. He's always asking questions. He's just very curious about the data uh, and very critical about is the data right? Does it really represent uh, the scenario? And I think that curiosity is something great to foster within a culture because if you can do it, your people are always going to learn, your process is going to improve, and you're going to get the results that you need. But you need that curiosity to start with. Uh, and then Austin, I had a chance to talk with maybe about a month ago, Austin, uh, we were talking and right away he was kind of going into the numbers on compact tractors and the turn metrics and how the aging uh, numbers have really changed here over this past year. And yeah, it seemed like every other sentence, he was just able to understand the industry in terms of numbers and what's changed. And so, yeah, I've just been impressed with Boyd and Sons as a dealership and then Austin with that conversation. So uh, just a couple of reasons why I wanted these two guys to be on here, because I think they, they do a great job of representing uh, the industry and a practical application of making database decisions. And now we'll kind of transition into the, the real meat and potatoes of what we're doing here. So I think everybody would agree that guiding your department or the entire dealership to utilize and make good decisions on available data is important, but I think we should get into why that's important. So to start, um, I think Kevin, we'll, we'll leave with you on this one. Where do you see data being available to help you and your dealership out the most in today's uh, business environment? Uh, coming from a lot of different places now, um, you know, there's uh, one, two, three, I would say three different uh, providers of data that when I started in 2013 that were not there. Um, back then it was kind of um, Iron Guides was the gospel. Um, and, uh, you know, since then we've we've added a lot of extra data points and uh, tried to refine the system so that it's uh, a little truer and uh, is more relevant to what's going on today than um, than where it might have been in the past. Uh, and so you know, and and a lot of those are as tractor zoom. It's it's live. You know, we're we're getting we're getting changes happening every day, and and that information is being updated every day. Um, just like our business system, you know, the 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 data that I pull from it, it it's live data. So that when I'm managing it or massaging it, filtering whatever I'm, I'm filtering with, with live things, so that my my decision making process is is uh, immediate. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Kevin kind of hit the nail on the head. Where where um, I kind of got back involved in the business when I got home from college in 2020. So I've been in it for three years now and. I think Kevin, you know, like I said, hit the nail on the head. There's there's new companies and more and more ways to get live real time data every day. It's it's never been more at your fingertips than it is today. Of why it's important uh, to make database decisions. I think we can also agree that implementing more database decisions can be easier said than done. So Austin, we'll start with you on this one. What has been the most challenging aspect of utilizing data? Yeah, so I guess the biggest challenge that I've kind of experienced is I've came back in and implemented, I'm a, I'm a data, I'm an analytics, I'm a numbers guy. So I study that a lot versus I've got some of my sales guys that have obviously been doing it a lot longer than I have that are kind of, you know, it's kind of hard to teach an old dog new trick sometimes. And I think you know the biggest challenge I've faced is we're kind of we're starting to accept the data, we're starting to understand the analytics, but it's also 
you know, getting the data is one thing, but understanding and analyzing the data is another. You know, it's you pull up a 2015 Bobcat P870 and they say, okay, here's the auction value. Well, you have to be smart enough to understand that you can't pay attention to the auction values from 2020 to 2022 during the COVID years and understanding it's matching the market trends with the analytical data that uh, I think I found the most challenging. And maybe Kevin can piggyback off of that. Oh, definitely. You know, yeah, it, it's it's the um, the currency as well as uh, the the regionality. Um, you know, for us, we've got um, our Wakefield, Virginia. They they have cotton and peanuts that that we don't have anywhere else, and so units down there are going to stay in that area. So you got to be careful how you're going to trade them. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, the. No, you you know your 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 history. That kind of went out the window as soon as COVID happened. Now it's it's uh, you have to take everything with a grain of salt and try to figure out what what does that history actually mean and and how to you how do we keep up with the new price changing and a new price increasing and where is that drag effect on the used and how far back does it go. Right. And uh, to throw it back to you, Austin, so if those are the struggles and, the, and maybe the tougher parts, what have been some of the easier aspects of um, basing more of your decisions on data? Well, I think for me, it kind of ties back into what Kevin talked about in the very original question for, you know, as I've tried to mold my my equipment guys into using the data, it's, uh, it's easy to get them to understand and want to use something that's instantaneous and at your fingertips. So, you know, when they can when they can go look at a trade and they can get back in their pickup and pull up their iPad and pull up, you know, iron comps or tractor house or whatever it may be and have the data at their fingertips, it's it's much easier for them. And being much easier for us, it's it's much easier for the customer and we're better to better factually serving them. And you know, we can turn around um, values and quotes a lot quicker the more data access we have at our fingertips. Uh, I, I think back to um, 2013 when I started in this. You know, it was uh, like I said, the the Iron Guides was the was the gospel, and and that was really the only data point that we were utilizing. And so it was, I um, I started to build some Excel files and and grab some information out of our business system, and we've changed business systems where we can get information a whole lot quicker and a whole lot easier. And um, you know, I can I can grab stuff from um, tractor or from iron comps and get it into a, a uh, Excel file so I can manage it easier. Um, that's probably the the biggest thing is so that I have ease of use and I can manage that data the way that I want. Um, not not that not that I'm trying to generate the answer that I want, but I can I can gen I can massage the data to help me get to the answers that I'm looking for. And it's much easier today than it was. Wondering why database decision making is important. Why don't we shift over to more of the cultural side? Because as Andy had mentioned a little bit ago, a data strategy should align with your business, but that can kind of become obscure or more challenging if you don't have a large centralized IT team to kind of take charge of that. So uh, we'll throw it back to you, Kevin. What have you or your dealership done to define your data strategy and what does that actually look like in practice? Uh, so I'm I'm it. Um, I, I am, uh, as the used equipment manager at Hoover's, I am the guy that does all the appraisals, that looks at all every possible trade-in and uh, puts a value on it. So. I'm that guy that's that's looking at that data, and I'm looking for ways to make that data management and uh, analysis a whole lot easier. Um, because it, it's I only have, you know, I, I've got X number of hours in every day to be able to process all of those requests, um, as well as do the other things that I need to do to maintain our inventory and and work with other dealers, and so. 
um, you know, the, the culture is definitely for me, as Andy said, I, I'm curious. I want to know because I want to make the right decision for Huber. I want to make sure that we are uh, buying our, our used equipment at the right value so that we can make a profit on it and not have too many mistakes. We all, we're going to make mistakes, but I don't want to make many mistakes. Um, so it's that um, I, I, I want data so that I'm not getting a dartboard and a dart out and making a guess. Yeah, I mean, we're pretty much in the same position as Kevin. And I uh, I do a lot of valuing myself. And then I've got a youth equipment manager that we kind of bounce ideas back and forth on and generally come to a conclusion together. But, you know, the one one biggest action item that we've done is, you know, we don't ever, I mean, obviously there are circumstances you get that way and you don't have a lot of analytical, analytical information on, but we don't ever put a value on something without having these two or three comparable pieces that we know have gone to auction or we've sold in our own database that uh, kind of back up the validity of, of the number we're putting into it. Good. Now, Austin, we'll stick with you. So piggybacking off that last question, what have you and your dealership done to build a better data culture? And what part of that plan has worked and what parts of it maybe haven't worked? Well, the first thing we've done that is a major must, and I've already heard Kevin hit on it, is we switched all of our business system two years ago, we switched to July of 2021, to a newer, more up-to-date system that allows us to pull data, pull the correct data, and pull it a lot quicker. So um, we've invested a, a nice chunk of money in a system, in a data-friendly system, but it's paid for itself tenfold. And, you know, I think Along with that, we, I'm fortunate my branch manager here is a uh, Excel guru and an analytical guy. A guy and we've got our own um, Excel sheets that we've built with all our historical data that we can pull out of the business system. We can pull it out of our historical Excel sheets on, you know, trade items, similar makes, models over the years. And then uh, obviously having the iron top piece, we have kind of three pieces we can go to and um, compare information with. No, Austin, Austin summed it up real well. Ben, uh, there's one thing that I want to add to to that one. And uh, and I've heard this from actually other conferences, but, you know, we say it here as well, track Zoom is that um, feel free to ask your solution provider uh, or anybody out there in industry just to help solve problems, too. Uh, that's one of the ways that I think we as track Zoom help advance a ton is Kevin can come to us and say, hey, I've got this problem. Can you help me solve it? And if we have a, a solution, then, then we can. But even better, uh, if we don't yet have a solution, then we can work with somebody and say, okay, how can we use the data available to help solve this problem? Uh, and so, and that's how better products, uh, better solutions get developed is just that conversation. And then, like I said, it's sometimes just as easy as, you know, raising your hand and saying, hey, I need some help on this. And can you help me out? Um, that a lot of good innovation comes that way. Transitioning more into the, the tech side of things, another thing that you had mentioned, Andy, is that data quality is important. But again, we know that many times data shows up in kind of a, a messy format. So you can sit in the notebook, for example. So Austin, we'll uh, start with you on this one. How have you had to change your own and your team's practices to better collect clean data and ensure that you're using trustworthy data? Well, I think, you know, for us, it kind of it kind of starts with what are you looking for? You know, all these different manufacturers are making different machines and they're all spec differently. And you know, um, you have to have factual information, false information, worse than no information. So, so for us, it's just starting with, hey, what are we looking at? What are the specs of it? We want to have serial number. We got to know our serial number breaks. We got to know specs. It's um, it's going into the mindset, knowing exactly what you're looking to pull out of the data. Whereas, you know, if you look at a Bobcat T870 and you pull the data, you know, one of those might be a high flow machine. One of them might be a single speed standard flow. And 
if you don't uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, it's hard to pull the right data. So I think I think the biggest thing I preach to our guys is you have to know what you're looking for going into it. I know for us, we, we uh, so the, the process was started before I took over, and it was a um, uh, our own in-house app that we utilize for grabbing the 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 data, the characteristics of a possible trade, and uh, and, and it it works really well, but it, it could be refined. The problem is to to refine it is going to require a lot of. Um, it's going to be a lot of effort and and the people that build it are no longer with us. So it's, that makes it that much more effort. So I would say learning from that, if you're going to in, invest in something like that, or if you're going to go down that road, make sure that it's something that's like more open uh, platform, I guess I want to say, so that you can adjust it and uh, refine it as you utilize it. And as the future comes along and, and equipment changes and your specs change that you want to grasp and it's not, um, not as difficult. Like it, it feeds into our business system in ways that, that are not going to be easy to uh, change for us. And so it's, um, but it's something that I want to change. I don't know how we're going to make it happen, but anyway, so I would say in, as far as when you're investing in tools, you know, don't only think about today and, and what you're wanting to get, but be thinking about at least five or 10 years down the road that, OK, you know, as equipment's going to change, we're going to be looking at it potentially someday drones. Um, I don't think any of us have, uh, you know, what what characteristics are we looking for in a drone? Um, and and there's going to be some autonomous vehicles as well and so what characteristics are we looking for there and um you know so uh those things you need to be thinking about hopefully that makes sense but um it's when, when you're making that investment in technology sure okay so the next thing i wanted to ask about is and we'll stick with you on this one, Kevin. How do you analyze the data that's available to you? Um, and if you could, you walk us back to and kind of explain what it was like for you three or four years ago versus how it is now. Sure. So when I started, it was you know, like I said, the, the Iron Guys was the Bible, um, and uh, the guy that I replaced, he was retiring. He'd been doing it for twenty years, and he had, had sold. Um, so, I mean, he was you know, a lot of experience in the industry, but um, it was kind of look in the iron guides if something is in there and then maybe find one or two pieces of, of comparable data. And uh, and that was it. Now, we don't have a, a centralized booking. I mean, it, it's the responsibility of each individual salesperson and the sales manager to put the final numbers on. My job is to give them some some guide rails, if you will, of what where the current market's at and uh, so anyway, so I came in, I have a, a, a lot more use of Excel. Um, I, I started working with our IT people and started grabbing some historical data, um, started building some what I call calculators that were based on, you know, I, at the time we had like 30 pieces of Great Plains Turbo Till that had been replaced by the Turbo Max. And it was like, oh my goodness, we you know, we oversaturated our market and how are we going to deal with this? And so it was, okay, we, we really need to put together some way to, to put true value on these units. Um, and, uh, you know, then, and I started building what I call my Bible. It's my, my uh, record of every appraisal of everything that I look at, um, which is a huge help because as I'm appraising things, if it's something that's out of the ordinary, Maybe I've already looked at something similar to that and what what value did I put on it when I looked at it and then did we actually sell it and did we make money on it? So I can look at those things and and pull that into the to the process of of, re, you know, what's the true value of that piece? And then there's obviously uh, tractor or iron comps. I, I, I go to iron comps. uh 
a lot. It's it's open. It's one of the screens that's open. Iron Comps is open. Tractor House is open. My historical data is open. Our business system's open. Um, um, what else? There's at least seven or eight screens that are open that are that are all data places for me to go, um, and uh, and and grab information to put together and and try to uh, refine that picture so that the information that I send back to the salesman and the sales manager of, of my recommendation is based on good information, current information, um, with what I truly feel is uh, a reasonable retail value. Say on the tail end of that? No, I mean, I think Kevin hit that one on the head. Yeah, and I can add that. You know, through user experience and surveys, uh, we found exactly what Kevin was talking about, where um, used equipment managers would have a much easier time going to sales if they had a very transparent report. Uh, and so we built something in Iron Comps where you can find comparables, print it out in a PDF report, send it over. And it was making that communication that much easier between used equipment managers and sales because they're looking at the exact same thing. You could see the comparables uh, with pictures, all the details. And so just that ease of user experience that these guys were talking about earlier in combination with good, reliable, clean data uh, just helps make those decisions much faster. Uh, and that also gives you more confidence too when you're making them. All right. uh, Austin, why don't we go back to you for this one? So staying in our theme of, of the tech side of this, how has working with TractorZoom helped regarding having um, clean data and being able to analyze that data? You know, I think I think my favorite my favorite thing about tractors and more so on the iron comp side of it is when, when I'm when I'm going to get a value, it's the very first site I open up. Obviously I use more than one, but when I need a, you know, the eye pops in, needs a quick reference, I haven't found a site out there that's easy to Number one, pull from a database that Iron Comps is pulling from. And I think I can send you month after month after month to see it get better and better and better. There's more and more data in there. But there's also just not a not a cleaner, more efficient, faster system that I found. It's just anytime I need a quick reference, it's it's what I go to. I, I totally agree with Austin. Um, you know, it, it's good information. Um, the The cool thing for me is there's a boatload of John Deere information out there. And that's where I don't want to make a mistake is on that green stuff. You know, um, I'm fairly certain I can make a good decision on our red trades. But uh, yeah, so it, it's nice to see that they are are so loaded up. Um, and, and, you know, that that's what we need is all that data, uh, regardless of your color, regardless of your make, you know, you, you want that data. And it is, as Austin said, it's very easy to use, very searchable. Um, you know, you can, you can pretty much share that app with anybody and they're going to be able to utilize it right off the get go. Okay. So if, if that's our conversation portion about tech, why don't we shift again into now um, the action side of this? Because this is all not much of a benefit if we don't act on this data. So um, we'll switch back to you, Austin, on this one. How do you make data easier to act on? And maybe what are the short and long-term milestones or goals that, you're, that you try to reach? So, you know, I guess for us, it's it's every day we're working towards how do we make this data more efficient? How do we access it quicker? Um, what shortcuts are we able to take or what steps are we able to take out of the equation? So for us, you know, our, our long-term goal is we, we're working on kind of developing our own internal database through Excel that we come, come make a combination of all the data and make it just that much easier to get to. You know, I think one of the things Kevin said well ago that, that I agree wholeheartedly with is for us, it's about finding the data. We're a Bobcat dealer. I'm really confident in my ability to, to value Bobcat pieces. I know the trends. I know the new sales history. I know what kind of you know cash incentives are out there, finance options are out there. But 
for me, it's, it's having the data on the case stuff, the Kubota stuff, the John Deere stuff that I'm not aware of what the new rebates or finance options may be. So it's, it's working to build that database of, you know, not even not even just the stuff that we're taking in on trade, but all the stuff we're valuing, the more information we can have, the the better and more efficient decision we're going to make. And Kevin can probably elaborate on that a little better than I can just because he's got much more experience doing it than I do. Uh, yeah, you know, he's, he's right. It, it's, it's, uh, I mean, you know, we all, we have contacts that we can, that I can reach out to on the other colors, but, uh, sometimes you can't get a hold of those guys or, you know, cause they're busy. They've got, they're, they're doing their job. So, you know, yeah, you're able to go into iron comps, check out that information, um, get good information on competitive pieces so that you are making that right decision. Um, you know, it, it, it it's um, pulling in all those points uh, just helps to um, give you confidence that that the the dollar value that you're going to put on this piece of equipment is is right. Um, you know, you can make a mistake on a three hundred dollar back blade. It's not a big deal, but you start making a mistake on a Five hundred fifty thousand dollar combine, one or two percent there can can be huge. And if it starts sitting on your lot for any length of time, especially today with interest at five six percent, it, it's it's hitting you hard. So you don't want to make those mistakes. The next thing I wanted to ask about, which is just that, um, and we'll stay with you on this one, Kevin. Um, I think we'd all agree that the world of tech is constantly changing. It's always in motion. How do you stay on top of that ever-changing tech world? Oh, uh, talk to Andy. <laughs> um, you know, um, ha ha honestly, have people like that um, that you know. Um, I uh, talk to other dealers, find out what they're doing, um, and. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not super techie, but I'm also not unwilling to um, try something out. To you know, um, I, I I use a little bit of paper for notes um, compared to the guy that took over for me. It was it was books and books and books of paper. You know, for me, it's a laptop and a couple of Excel files and and uh, a piece of notebook paper. Um, so it, it that's possibly a generational thing too. Um, good good possibility. That Austin probably uses less than what I use. Yeah, I mean, I guess for for me, kind of Kevin hit on it a little bit, but to me, the best the best way for to stay on top of technology and to understand the ever changing is you have to have a good you have to have a good relationship with. The people that are representing the tools that you're using, you know, have a good relationship with Andy or, you know, whoever it may be. the The easiest, the easiest, and the quickest way to learn how to use the new technology is for them to tell you and show you. And if you can, um, you know, their job is to help you, I guess. So, so use them. And um, then, Andy, yeah, go ahead. yeah. Kevin said that you're such a smart guy. I wonder if you had anything to share with us. I don't know. That's uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, in regards to that question, you know, the just trying to stay on top of things. A couple things that that I've done, uh, and this is really attracted to the side. But you know, trying to set aside time to read outside the industry. You know, whether it's listening to podcasts or or reading, you know, books. Uh, just I think you can learn stuff from other industries and then apply it. Uh, and that kind of spurs some creative juices and and gets things going. The other piece that I've really noticed is uh, if you have to teach something. And so I think a lot of dealers are out there where you know you're always pulling in new staff and trying to retain them. I think uh, educating 
you know, new staff is really valuable to them. Uh, you know, being new staff, they need to grow and understand the industry. But on your side, in terms of staying on top of things, if you have to learn something, uh, there's no better way to learn it than having to teach it. And so um, that's just two of the things, you know, setting aside time to read, but also finding people that you have to teach has a, a dual benefit of teaching them, keeping them, retaining them, but also you, uh, you have to stay on top of it as well. On this one, Kevin, um, how is working with TractorZoom helped you um, uh, get from the data to the decision faster? Uh, it, it's, um, well, you know, as Austin said, it's easy to utilize. It's, it's, um, good, clean data. You know, we don't have to go in there and think, okay, is this for real? You know, did this sale really happen? Did, did this piece get really get sold at that price? Um, no, the, it, it, it was for real, you know, um, that's the, the first thing, um, and I just lost my train of thought. I apologize. Uh, um, yeah, Austin, help me out here, bud. Yeah, no, I think number one is it, it is the it's the ease of use, it's the ease of access. You know, you can access it from your computer, tablet, phone, whatever it may be. It, it's clean data. Um, the other part that, you know, I haven't completely just mastered and understood on the iron comp side that I'm trying to understand more and more every day is, you know, you obviously I base all my information off the auction stuff, but more and more, and maybe Kevin sees that with the big ag stuff, because I guess they, I see more of that trend. They're getting that data quicker, maybe. Uh, but the dealer listings, you know, you can see uh, not only, not only do I know what these pieces are bringing at auction, but more and more as the data gets in there, you see, you know, here's what the dealers have in their inventory. Um, I guess the other thing I look at is, hey, Kevin's had this, he's got this combine and he's got it listed, but he's also had it listed for, you know, 180 days. And there's, there's probably a reason it's listed 180 days. So, you know, make some decisions based off that. Yeah, I'll, I'll add too that, you know, I, I've had a uh, really good conversation with Andy multiple times on, you know, hey, this is what we're thinking. This is how I do things. How can I, uh, how can I pull data down? How can I grab it? Um, and, you know, they, they have been extremely helpful in working with me to, to refine my process and, and make it better. Yeah, and then kind of to build off that, uh, in combination with what Austin was talking about, about something potentially reaching 180 days and and learning from those conversations with Kevin and and other dealers. Uh, and we're always trying to help dealers get to that next decision and that next step. So that led to like us building our inventory tool uh, where we're able to, you know, because we're already listing the stuff on TractorZoom, we know the inventory that's out there. And then we can start to alert people through predictive analytics of, hey, is it likely to get to 180 days? And so I know our data scientists just released a a new tool within Iron Comps, it's time on lot. And this is just within the past week, I believe, that shows a prediction of, hey, you know, whether it's priced too high, whether the market's slowing down, whether it doesn't have pictures, it's given a prediction of this thing is likely to go over 180 days or 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 not. Uh, and so you can take action on that. And so it's through those conversations uh, with Kevin and other dealers that we're able to say, okay, what's the process? What eventual decision do you want to get to? And how do we help make that uh, a seamless single decision for you? So you're not having to try to remember to do it or getting it lost in the papers. Uh, so yeah, so that time on lot, our inventory tool and a bunch of others are ones that dealers are using just to have the tool help them and enable them to get to that decision a whole lot faster and more confidently. I don't know, Pierre, I want to remind all our attendees, if you have a question, there's a Q&A icon at the bottom. Feel free to drop it in there because we're going to get to our uh, our question and answer period in a little bit here. But now that we've covered all this all this ground, what benefits you guys are seeing from it? And we'll, we'll start with you on this one, Austin. Um, what advice would you have for others who are implementing or beginning to implement their own uh, data strategy? Uh, I guess my biggest thing that I would start with is, you know, if you think 
if you think you need to make a change and you think I'll, I'll use our business system for an example, um, the, the biggest, the biggest thing I regret the most about that is not changing it sooner. Um, I got back in, in pretty involved in the business my, after my sophomore year of college and in 2018. And, and I knew kind of for three years before we decided to start making the change that a change needed to happen. And, and just the, the efficiencies and the streamlines of, being able to extract our data, to pull our data. I wish now that I had the three years of data that I delayed on making the change. Um, I guess it's a it's a data-driven world and I, I truly believe it's gonna get more and more like that. So the, the quicker you can switch to something like that, it, it's there's a lot of headache that comes with it, but there's a lot of reward once you get the process and procedures in place. thoughts you have and advice for people on how they can do what you've done? Uh, you know, ultimately, you can't be afraid to make a decision. Um, you know, get get as many data points as you can, and, and then you make a decision from there. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as Austin said, you know, you're going to look at the cost, you're going to look at the the effort, the, the overall expense, and you say, man, is it really worth it? Well, you make a few mistakes on a few pieces of, of units and yeah, it's worth it real quick. You know? So if, if you can, if you make an investment in, in an app or a, or a subscription to a, you know, a service like iron comps or tractor zoom um, you know, yes, it's expensive, but at the end of the day, it, it can save you uh, from making those mistakes. It'll cost you quite a bit of money. Yeah. And uh, to kind of build off that, one of the things that I've seen a lot of dealerships do, uh, and also, you know, we work with ag lending institutions as well, is if they're really looking to improve their data game, they will look and say, okay, where can I get the highest ROI right away? And it it helps in two factors. It it obviously helps with the buy-in for upper management, because if they see that ROI factor, it's like, it's an easier decision for them, but it also creates a little bit of guidelines. Of like, okay, it's a business decision. What are we looking to get out of it? What kind of return investment uh, goes into it? And then also though, if it's low hanging fruit in terms of the ROI, it's, you know, it's a good, easy goal to chase. Uh, and so your business can have success. Everybody's happy. And you start that ball rolling in the momentum side. Um, and I think a lot of businesses do this. We certainly do it where we'll work with the business on a proof of concept. Say, okay, let's give it a, just a three month runway and say if we can get this going and then that gives the business an assurance of hey it's not a long-term commitment we're gonna we're gonna give it all for three months and try to prove out that return once you do then the ball continues to roll and then you get to reap those benefits that kevin was talking about so it's uh like i mentioned earlier just asking questions and working with you know solution providers or whatever it is uh you know put the onus on them and and have them help you get there q and if anyone has questions about tractor zoom like listing for free like you mentioned previously how would they get in touch with you right many ways i mean you can always go to websites tractorzoom.com and ironcoms.com but uh invariably after all these webinars i usually get about five to ten emails and so a campbell uh, and i'll show it here actually maybe it's the next slide uh there so uh a campbell at tractorzoom.com it's the easiest and uh, just shoot me an email and um, you know, we can set up a time to call. Uh, that's usually the best way and the easiest way for people. And even if it's just a, Hey, I want to learn more, or even if it's a, you know, you talked about compacts, but I want to go more in depth on what compacts are doing in Georgia. Um, then it can be that discussion too. So email best way. All right. Um, and there is a question that we just received from an anonymous attendee that says, for small and single location dealerships, uh, I, think, I think this is for you, Andy, how do you recommend investing the time in data or a data platform? Is this also a future investment in time savings or does it require more resources? And Austin and Kevin, if you have input on that. Yeah, I can start to answer it. And then Kevin Austin, if you guys have, uh, you know, some feedback or want to fill in, but it, um, 
you know, it's like I said, uh, a short term investment. And really what we usually do with the smaller dealerships is they like to dip their toe in the water and say, hey, I just want to list on TractorZoom for free. And then, you know, one of the things that that actually does and can provide is our data analytics works on all ends of the platform. And so we have a the outlier detection. And so if the data is flowing in and it notices some price is way off or hours might be way off, that can get flagged. And so we can just, you know, for free, uh, alert the dealership and have that fixed. And sometimes that helps, you know, move things through instead of having it sit on a lot unnoticed for a while. And so in terms of long-term commitment and everything, you know, dip your toe in the water first. It's the 21st century and uh, there's a lot of options out there in terms of technology. So, um, yeah, that's what I would suggest. And then, like I said, the, the proof of concept allows you to get going and, uh, and yeah, and see if it's right for your type of business. And I just wanted to ask, uh, I had a question, Andy, kind of actually, as you were going through here. And I, in Austin and Kevin, I'll, I'll direct this to you too. Um, maybe looking forward a couple of years, if, if this is all that's happening right now with data management and data management plans, um, how do we think those needs might change down the line? Or the, is the dealership of three years from now going to have different needs? Or, or what are you guys thinking about as dealers, what you might be needing in three years? Equipment's going to change a little bit. Uh, I, I guess for me, I'm I'm constantly like, okay, are we getting the right specs? Whenever a salesman's out there looking at the piece of equipment, um, so uh, that that's what I'm really worried about and, and and thinking about in the future is making sure that we can adjust our our gathering process to get the right specs that are pertinent for that time. Yeah, you know, to kind of to kind of hit on what um, Kevin alluded to there, one of the interesting things that I'm not quite sure how we're going to work through on on even just the Bobcat side of things is they're starting to do it. So I'm sure other manufacturers are going to start to do it. We're starting to roll out these what they call feature on demand packages where Andy can buy a skid steer and it's equipped with all these features and if he decides that he wants to just buy a two-speed machine um, at this time, he can turn the two-speed feature on and then he has, you know, X amount of years, he can turn on high flow, he can turn on ride control, he can turn on these options, you know, at which point these machines get traded in and, and it's without a, with it's out of um, time frame to spec. How are we able to access that with the serial numbers given to us? Um, I don't worry about it so much on the Bobcat side because I have the Bobcat analytic program to do that. But how does Kevin evaluate a Bobcat customer that's looking to trade on a case or how do I evaluate a case customer looking to trade on a Bobcat? That's kind of one of the challenges I see over the next three to four years with the equipment itself. On to that, otherwise we had one last question that came in. Yeah, just on that one from Austin, that's that's a great challenge, I think, in the industry. And that's one that we're also paying attention to here at TractorZoom is, you know, and it's not just, you know, those call them a SaaS feature on a piece of equipment. You can kind of say it's a little uh, analogous to row options on a planner or something, that there's a lot of this stuff that can be turned on, turned off. That's not just a traditional, you know, it's 12 row planner or it's a tractor with so many horse. Uh, it gets down to the data structure. And uh, and that's one of the things that we're interested in helping dealers solve as well. And to Kevin's point earlier, we've heard it before and we're actually working on uh, a solution uh, that is all about the ingestion of good quality data. Uh, because Kevin's right, if it doesn't come in clean and right, then it's a pain. Uh, and how do you help standardize that and make that easy for dealerships? So uh, yeah, we're gonna be excited here real soon to, to share with everybody about what we've got um, in that regard. Our question from Kyle, who says, um, what do Kevin and Austin think will happen with sales and prices with bonus depreciation going down this year? If either of you care to throw out an answer to that. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer. I, I mean, I, I see the market slowing down. Hmm. Any thoughts, Austin? No, I, I'm I'm with Kevin. I, I see it slowing down. Um, 
I guess the, the challenge that I face is, you know, if I was a if I was a betting man, I would have bet it would have slowed down a lot more than it has right now. Um, so m- my biggest fear is, are we going to continue in this gradual slowdown, or are we going to uh, wake up one day and hit a brick wall? Okay. Yeah. And Kevin and Austin, I've given this some thought too. So I'll talk to you guys offline. And anybody else that's uh, that's watching this wants to chat. I've got some ideas on how we might study this and and see if this is already happening. So I'd like to bounce those ideas off you guys, though. Look at that work happening as we speak on the webinar, future meetings. Okay, well, uh, with that, that's all the time that we have for today. So today's presentation and audio will be available on the Farm Equipment website in the future if you'd like to go back and review this webinar. Uh, watch your email for more information on that from the Farm Equipment newsletter. And on behalf of Andy, Austin, Kevin, Tractor Zoom, and Farm Equipment Magazine, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, feel free to reach out to let us know what you thought of the event, uh, if there's any future topics you would like us to cover in our future webinars. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your time and your expertise. And with that, I'm going to wish everyone a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>